You, you don't have to apologize to me. <laughs> Good to see you, dear. Come on in. Yeah, I'm talking to you guys. Good morning. Good to see you all. I have, uh, there's two announcements that need to be given today. I'm going to give one of them, and then Jim is going to come forward and give the other. And since chronologically Jim's comes first, I will let you start with that. Come on up. You're welcome. So uh, just a reminder for everybody, the congregational check-in meeting is right after our uh, worship time. I think we have some finger food, light snacky stuff, no meals, because we don't anticipate the meeting to go a long time. It's just a quick update meeting uh, for everyone. So we encourage if you uh, are able to stay, we would sure just love to have you stay and uh, have our participate with us in our check-in meeting. So. Thank you. Doing those just to kind of make sure that communication's open and we all know what's going on. And, and so, yeah, we do want to encourage you to come and ask questions and find out all the little interesting details about what's going on. If we don't know, we'll tell you that. Because sometimes we don't. Uh, the second announcement is that we're going to have an ice cream social. Um, so coming up... <laughs> Carrie's very excited about that. Uh, so on the 14th of September, the weather will still be beautiful. It'll be cooling off, but it'll be ice cream, because I don't know what, what's not ice cream weather, right? So we're going to ha have an ice cream social here. It's a Saturday. Starts at 7 o'clock. We invite you to come out. We've invited uh, a fiddle group from Melba to come and give us some music. We have extended the invitation to the district, so there'll be some folks from the other churches, hopefully, that come and participate in that. Um, also, invite your neighbors um, because we'd like to make it kind of a community event and it will just be a lot of uh, a good time with ice cream. Um, if you are able to make homemade ice cream, um, we would love to talk to you. So if you have a cooler and would like to contribute something, you can come up with some wacky weird recipe that uh, like bacon flavored ice cream or something like that. Uh, I don't even know if that's a thing, but uh, somebody's going somebody's gonna to, yeah, there's a challenge that's been thrown out. Make a good bacon-flavored ice cream. Um, so that's the 14th of September, and we do encourage you to come and participate in that. I'm going to step aside. Byron, begin our service, please. Good morning. It's been a, a really wonderful week. Uh, my wife has been up helping a Mennonite group and not, it wasn't wonderful because she's not there. <laughs> but she's sending good reports from camp, wonderful things going on. And um, I had a, a nice meeting yesterday at Homedale watching the red, blue, or the red, white game right after our meeting. And um, the district had a meeting yesterday, and boy, good people, good showing up, good attitudes. Um, keep in prayer, Lorraine. But what a wonderful um, setup. Please mark your calendars, October 11 and 12. We have Jeff Carter coming. We have, we have several people from back east coming, and it's going to be a wonderful time. What's that? Oh, the district annual conference. There's a different, difference between annual conference and the district annual conference. Okay, don't, don't get too turned around on that. But you're right. We need to say, this is our annual conference for the district, and there are some wonderful churches out there that our brothers and sisters are working very hard and doing what we're doing this morning, worshiping. So please mark your calendars for 11 and 12 October. Um, it, it is truly a wonderful time we, we have planned. I had at, at, the, at the football red-blue practice, I did have the superintendent ask me if, uh, if I was going to, Re renew my endorsement. 
he noticed my endorsement was over on the 23rd, on the uh, last year. And I said, no. <laughs> and I'm not answering my phone <laughs> after six years of long-term sub. It's time to retire and do a little more of this. <laughs> so this morning, I would like to tell you that um, it's wonderful. I've been watching, reading your scripture and doing wonderful things with it. We almost took it for a theme. <laughs> it was just absolutely wonderful. So the scripture this morning, if you want to look for it, is John 13, 34 and 35. John 13. It's nice when I open it and I've underlined it and I've highlighted it. So I, I've, I've seen this one. This is a good one. A new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, this morning as we begin our service and a new day begins, we humbly come before you in prayer. Fill our hearts with gratitude for the gifts of life and the blessings that surround us in everywhere we look. Grant us strength and wisdom to face the challenges ahead of us, both personally and as a church, and then as a district. Please grant us strength and wisdom to take those challenges on. Guide our thoughts, and our words, and our actions, that they may reflect your love and bring hope to others. May your grace and peace be with us throughout this day of worship and throughout this week and through our lives. Amen. Good morning. Please jump up, stand, if you can.
you. And now, 373 is out true line. I wasn't too sure in coming up here because I looked at the bulletin and it said offering and prayer Carlene Cage. Uh, so I watched closely. <laughs> it's fine. Miss Prince are okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Studies show that people who express gratitude experience improved sleep, higher stress tolerance, and more meaningful relationships. But gratitude is not only benefits for us physically, it draws us closer to God. This day when we're worshiping, discover the purpose and power of thanking God by sharing with a great attitude, trying to develop a wonderful relationship with him as you give. Pray with me, please. Our family, Heavenly Father, we want to thank you, Lord, for the gifts and the givers. Bless us all to work harder for your will and to use these resources for your glory. Amen. So there, there are a few mistakes in the bulletin today. <laughs> and uh, uh, Marianne's going to share a little bit about that. Uh, just to make sure we're on the right page with the right song. Uh, do pray for Stacy. not, I proof the bulletin, and so these are my mistakes that, that are in there, but she's been suffering this week a lot with kind of a post-COVID crud. Um, she keeps trying to come in and get things done, and I'm like going, oh man, don't come in. Just stay home, get some rest. So do be praying for her. She is struggling a little bit with her health on that. So um, not as an explanation, just, just be praying for her. Kids. Come on up. Last week, my science got derailed by a pinata, so I have it this week, and we're gonna we're gonna try it this week. And if you're an adult and you want to watch this, you got to come up here. So nobody's getting up. Okay, I have fire. So, all right. Who knows what that is? 
It's not a hard question. A bottle. Yeah, yeah. And I got some lighters. I got some. Oh, yeah. So, okay. I have eggs in this bowl. Let's see here. I think that's a pretty good egg. It's a good egg. So, I'm going to put the egg right there. Do you think you could get that egg in the bottle without touching it? No? no? You think so? Oh, I want to hear your theory on how you might pull that off. Well, you could crack it. You could crack it? Yeah. Well, but you can't touch it because you can't, so you can't crack it. But these are, these are boiled eggs, so they don't have a shell on them. So, well, I'm going to try something, all right? We're going to try and see if this experiment works. So I have to tear these up a little bit. I'm going to put my egg down. I'm going to stick those in the bottle. Make sure I got plenty in there. And I'm going to take the lighter here. Okay. I think the fire ran out. Think it went out? Yeah. Are you guys watching it? They're applauding for science. <laughs> so, I forgot to look up why it does that. I was going to do that and tell you, I think it has to do with heat and pressure and air volume and all the different things that science talks about. I just think it was pretty cool, right? I didn't have to touch that, and the egg went whoop right in the bottle. Do you know that God can do things that we can't do? That's pretty impressive. There's things that you can do in life, right? You can pick things up. You can tie your shoes. You can, well, you can flip your sandals on, your slip-ons. So you can do things in life. But what's something that you can't do that you kind of feel like would be good if it were done? Ah, you're imagining things. Yeah, there's some things. There's some things that I would like to have done that I can't do either. It's like I, there's some people that are sick that I would like to get better that I want them to be healed. There are some people that are, that are maybe not getting along really well that I would, like to get along, I would like them to get along really well. And those are things that I can't really do much about. But you know what? God can. God can do things that we can't do because God has all the power that is necessary to do the stuff that we can't do. Just like that bottle got sucked in there all on its own or the egg got sucked in the bottle all on its own, God can do things that we can't. Is that pretty special? So whenever you think about all those impossible things that you would like to have done that would be really good, but you just don't have the power to do that, trust God because God can do miraculous things. Shall I pray? Dear Lord, thank you that you can do things that we can't. Thank you that you can heal people that we can't and you can bring people together that we can't and you can fix things that we can't. And Lord, we thank you more than anything for Jesus who saved us because we can't. We're so grateful for you doing the things that you can do and helping us with the things that we can't do. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you guys can go. I'll let you figure that one out, so... That was one of my favorite things about being a teacher is doing fun experience, experiments like that. Because, right? Please stand. Help us to help each other, Lord, each other.
had a backup plan on that if that didn't work. So God forgives us when we make mistakes. And so I'm glad it did work. So uh, the passage that, that Byron read earlier out of John's gospel comes from a section of the gospel where Jesus is basically, he's telling his disciples the last things that he wants them to know. This is in the upper room. This is at the end of his journey. This is, he's, he's headed to the cross in the next few hours. And so this is a kind of a, an encapsulation of all the really, 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 really important things that the followers of Jesus, both in this day and today, need to know. And what does he say? Love each other. A new command I give you, that you should love one another. He says it again, and you'll hear it in the text that I'm going to read for this part of the message. This is in, in chapter 15. He says, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And I said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. The text that Byron read said it was a new commandment. I have to wonder to myself what they were doing before, if this was new. It seems like this has always been part of what God wants for us, that we would love one another. My uh, brother and sister-in-law, those of you who know my brother, is Big Dave. I am the little one in the family, so if you wrap your heads around that. Big Dave and his wife, Kim, have three kids. Um, I call them kids. They're not really kids. They're they're, they're all living their full adult lives at this point. Catherine's the oldest. She lives with her husband up in Seattle. Andrew, he's the middle one, and he and his wife live in Redmond, Oregon. They have the one great-grandchild for my folks, and so uh, uh, they're, well, I don't know if they're proud of that or not, probably are, but it's kind of special. And then Henry is the youngest. Now, Henry is getting married to Kenzie on the 1st of September. In a couple of weeks, uh, this is going to happen and I've had the privilege, I got the privilege uh, to officiate at their wedding. Uh, I get to go there and, and, and stand and, and try to stay out of the way, basically, is what it's going to amount to. And I'll say this. Each of these kids has done pretty well when it comes to this marriage thing. They've done well in this department. There's ups and downs, and there's miscommunication, there's struggles. But they all seem pretty nicely matched. The, the people that they have chosen to bring into the family, they're good, good people. And I hope that their families feel the same about, about my niece and nephews. There is a lot of unknown in front of them. These are young kids. They're just really getting started in this whole, uh, this whole marriage thing. They've got quite a bit uh, in front of them, but they all seem to be starting out pretty well. And that's important. Relationships are important. We all inhabit them. We all live in these relationships, and we all have a sense, maybe from personal experience, about how rough life can be when our relationships are not well-formed. And God knows this too, which is why the transformation of our relationships is part of that whole spirit, whole being transformation that God wants to bring about in our lives. And marriage... It's probably a pretty good place to start this conversation. I know you probably are familiar with the story, and you can turn to it if you want. It's easy to find. It's at the very beginning of the Bible uh, in Genesis. I think we should look at this again uh, through the lens of godly relationships. There in Genesis, we have two accounts of creation. You're familiar with this, I'm sure. On the first uh, is that classic seven days of creation account. On day one, on day two, God did this, God spoke that. And it starts in the first chapter, and then it rolls over into the first part of the second chapter. And then right on the heels of the first account, we get the second account, it's a little more detailed, a little more intricate. The story is a little richer, perhaps. Uh, it's an account that tells us about the way that God reached down to the dirt, down to the soil, the dust, and brought together this, 
this body which became man and how he breathed life into the nostrils of the man and, and, and created this thing that wasn't like anything else. Now, this is man, masculine here, not like the Adam, humankind, that the first account talks, talks about. And the sequence in the second story, it's a little different than the first story, but, but that's not really important. This second account, its focus is on relationships, how this creature, this, this created thing, the dust of the earth with the breath of life in it, how it relates to the rest of creation. So God creates man and then places man in the garden, gives him work to do. You're supposed to tend it and care for it and take care of it, till the, till the soil. And so this is what we start out with. The problem is that the man is alone. In all of creation, there's no counterpart for man. No one for that intimate relationship that can only be realized by those who are of the same kind. And God knows this. God is fully aware with this. He says it right, right up front. It is not good that man should be alone. And so God takes all the creatures that have been created and parades them in front of man and the man names each one of them and throughout them all he finds that there is none like him. There is no suitable helper. And so we get this beautiful story of God causing a deep sleep to fall on the man and, and God taking a rib from his side and creating his counterpart, his completion. And the man realizes it. He says, ah yes, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Great, great stuff. There's so much in Genesis that points to deeper truths. Within the truth, there's allegory and metaphor. It's designed to guide us to something more meaningful. This woman, the helper, not subservient in any way. The phrase helper here is the Hebrew azar, which is used outside of this example and, all, and a couple of, of references to more powerful nations who were allied to the Hebrews. It's used exclusively to describe God, as in God is my helper and my strength. This is a helper from a position of strength, a, a helper who makes up for the insufficiency of the one being helped. So more than anything in this story, we see the woman and the man as two parts of a single whole. This is the meaning of the one flesh there that comes later, the 24th verse of Genesis 2. Jesus himself quotes that verse and reaffirms it in Matthew 19. And so right here at the very beginning of the story, in the Genesis account, the significance of relationships and how important they are is front and center. The relational God. You remember the verse who says, let us make humankind in our image, creates a creature who is designed from the very beginning for relationships. Humanity is not meant to be alone. It is not good. So relationships are not optional. As if we could say, well, I'll take them and leave them. I'll do what I want to, you know, whatever. No, we are supposed to be in relationship. They are implied from our very origin with our creator, with each other, with the rest of the world. So Adam and Eve, they start off pretty well. I mean, things are going nice, it's good, everything's clicking along. At least in them we see a couple who does seem to be flesh of flesh and bone of bone. Uh, in what little the Genesis account tells us of them, they do seem to walk lockstep together. They're always together doing the things that they need to do. Uh, even when it comes to sin, <laughs> they sin together in this. But their first fundamental failure comes when they drop the ball in this relationship that they're supposed to have with God. God is like, oh, let's just kind of keep him off at the distance. We don't, he's, a, he, he's kind of a third wheel in our thing going on here. We want to do what we want to do. Someone that we circumvent in order to fulfill our gratification. But again, you know the story. It does not end as expected. They're cast out of Eden from paradise. They have to make their way in the thorns and the sweat and the pain and all of that. Now their kids, their kids seem to pick up on this relational failure uh, as well. What 
greater relational failure can you imagine than fratricide to kill your own brother? But this is exactly what Cain and Abel do. This is the story. We see here in this relational failure that it seems to show up initially in that very fundamental and foundational and central relational context, the family. That's where it seems like things start to go wrong. It's probably inevitable. The family, it is the foundation of all relationships, and so it is also the foundation of brokenness in relationship. This is the closest we will ever be to other people. And so it's there that our human failure is the most evident. Last week we talked about the way that God wants to transform our emotions. And we mentioned this very fact last week that we are social creatures. God has designed us in this way so that we will interact and relate to each other. We talked about this, this principle that psychologists have identified. They put a label on it. They call it emotional resonance. We resonate with the emotions of other people. We pick up on their joy. We pick up on their fear, their contentment, their anxiety. I mean, you know what this is like. You are around people that are anxious. What do you feel? Anxious. You are around happy people. You feel happy. We're designed this way. We can't help but start feeling the things that other people feel. Now, if we weren't meant to be together, if that weren't part of the design, then this capacity would be useless. You know, we really need it, so why even have it? But we are social creatures, incredibly social creatures, and so this resonance is critical to all of our functioning. We use it to learn about things, how to navigate in the world around us, to, to teach ourselves and others what is appropriate and what is not. And the family, the family is the crucible of that instruction. That's where it happens. People think about families in terms of procreation. We're just here to keep having, you know, keep the species going. I don't think that's the primary use of families. I think families are intended to teach each other about things, to pass on not genetics, but wisdom. And the family is where we do that. So think about this. Dad comes home and he's had a bad day. Something happened at the plant or at the office or something was bad and he has a bad day and he slams the door and he stomps through the house to the back room. Well, okay, mom, being emotionally resonant, picks up on that mood and responds with her own, reflects back her own anxiety, her own anger. And then who picks up on mom's emotions? Billy. Poor Billy. Billy learns in that moment that slamming doors and stomping through the house gets a specific response from mom. And so if he wants to trigger that same response, he stomps and slams. This is what he learns. No words are exchanged. No essays are written. No tests are taken. But something is learned in that home. And without the presence of the Spirit of God, the lesson gets repeated and repeated and reinforced until it's just part of Billy's nature which then he takes into his own family. See, there's no escaping this. There's no escaping the influence that we have on each other. To be outside of all relationships is to die. Literally, total isolation from other human contact will destroy a person. They've done studies on this. Babies that are not held as infants wither. The, the clinical label, failure, failure to thrive, I hate that. It's like, oh, they're failures. You know, no, this is something we did to them, all right? And so many of them die early. Infant death, it's, you can look it up, and you'll see that this is the fact. See, we can't live outside of relationships. And when we are in relationships, we will influence each other. We will have an impact on each other. We will teach each other what is expected what is appropriate and what is not. I mention this because it ties back to what we mentioned a few weeks ago when we began this series, that it's a fundamental point of spiritual formation that we are always being formed. There's always something that is shaping us. Like being water makes us wet. Being around people means that we will be influenced by them and we will influence them in turn. 
So this is painfully obvious in the family, the family where all sorts of malformations start to occur. They have the potential where abuse and infidelity, where neglect and hostility actually bear their fruit. But this sort of malformation, it doesn't stay in the family, it doesn't stay in the home, it has a way of creeping out like a vine to, to get tangled in society, in the public sphere where other people are dehumanized and marginalized, where others are treated like they are less than a fellow creature also made in the image of God, also loved by God. And that pain and that brokenness of our world proves it. You've seen this. You've witnessed it. You know what I'm talking about. So, we're not great at this. <laughs> we're not great at relationships. You know, it's just part of who we are as human creatures. The Jewish philosopher Martin Buber talked about this. I think he put it best. He compared the two fundamental types of human relationships. He said that there's the I-thou relationship, in which a person, each one, is fully human, fully understood. And then he compared that to the instrumental I-it relationship, in which we treat the other in a materialistic, instrumental sort of way. Okay, we have, or we should have, I-thou relationships with people that we respect, with, with our equals, with other fellow creatures. The best sort of I-thou relationship can be found in a good marriage, where the man and the woman are mutually supported and, and respectful of each other, each of them honoring and recognizing the, the other as a child of God, one made in the image of God. An I-it relationship is a relationship that we have with an object, a thing. I have an I-it relationship with my coffee maker. I don't relate to my coffee maker as another human creature. It's just a coffee maker. It, it, I put the water in, I put the coffee grounds in, uh, hopefully with a filter, and, and I turn it on, and I have hot coffee in return. It's an instrument designed to benefit me with this beverage that I so desperately need every morning. But we so often treat people this way. We so often treat people as instruments. We enter into these I-it relationships with them they're only there to benefit me. They're a means to an end. I input what I want into them, and I expect them to reciprocate in a predictable way. In this commerce-driven world that we happen to inhabit, employers often relate to their employees from that I-it perspective. The employee is an interchangeable cog in the machinery of industry. Husbands and wives sometimes treat their partners, like an it, they often change them out when things aren't going well, when things aren't paying off. What happens to our understanding of marriage when partners are tossed aside like faulty coffee makers? So many of our relationships fall into this I-it category, when, and that temptation is there, persistent, it's always there. And while it is there, I would argue this, that at any time we treat another person in that instrumental way, as we see them as less than a human creature, as an it and not a thou, we are reinforcing those malformations of relationships. Just like Cain, the other becomes an obstacle in the way of our self-fulfillment. And so we get them out of the way. And because they are not human, because they are an it, murder seems reasonable. I know I'm overstating it there. Human interactions are very incredibly complex, and I, and I honor that, and I don't want to oversimplify Buber's categories, I, thou, I, it, they in themselves are a little overly simplified, but they still are helpful. And I believe that we're seeing in our world, in our culture today, in our neighborhoods, in our churches, in our families, so much malformation, treating people as less than the person that God made them to be. So if we want to get to where we need to be in our relationships, we need to start somewhere. We need to start at the center of this model of spiritual formation that we've been talking about. I want you to remember this. I'll refresh your memory. You don't even have to be here when we talked about it. I'll, I'll bring you up to speed here. The center of all spiritual formation, of us becoming what God wants us to be, the center of it is this truth. God has created us special. 
God has created us special. He has put his own image in us. We read that again in Genesis, so much in Genesis, that God has created humankind in his own image. In his image, he created them, male and female, he created them. That's unique. No other part of creation has that, just us, okay? So God has created us with his own image in us. And then point two, God's eternal love will not rest until we are fully formed in the image of Christ. Created in the image of God, loved into the likeness of Christ. That's the center of spiritual formation. Now, God's love is resistible. I know that seems weird to say that. It kind of doesn't really come out of my mouth very well. But it is. God is not going to force his love on us. We can reject it. We can reject and, and not realize this transformative power. But if we are willing to enter into this, if we are willing to step through the door, God's love is more than sufficient to bring about any transformation. So I want to unpack that a little bit. Here we are today, this morning, we're sitting in a group of people. And I want you to forget about that for a second. I want you to think of yourself in an, as an individual, single entity. I don't usually do that because I'm encouraging you to think beyond yourselves. But for the moment, go ahead and think of yourself as an individual. Personal terms. You, as an individual, each one of you, has been made in the image of God. You. You personally, has been made in the image of God. There's some kind of a mark, a reflection, a, a special sign of God's agency and God's perfect creative spirit in each one of you. You are designed and intended to reflect God's glory. This is who you individually are. That's pretty special. That's good stuff, okay? I want you to be excited about that. God did this for you, gave you this gift of his own image. So that's in each of you. Take a hold of that, personally. Second thing I want you to grab a hold of, again, personally, you are loved. You are so loved. God loves you, personally, so, so much. So much so that Jesus was willing to come and give his own life, shed his perfect blood for you, for your sake. You are loved. Wow. You should be getting excited now. This is good stuff, okay? So each of you, personally, individually, singled out and known by God to receive this precious gift, the image of God, and also receive God's powerful and eternal love. That's who you are as an individual, as a person, as a human creature. God loves you. Excited about that? That's pretty cool, right? Now, take off the blinders that were keeping you thinking individually here and look around. All right? Okay. Step out of your individualism. God also loves the person next to you. God loves the person in front of you, behind you. God loves them. God also put his image in them. <laughs> now, in this space, we're okay with that. We like these people. We've committed to being here this morning. We, 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 we've chosen this kind of, kind of shared life to, together. So it's good. It's good to think about how much God loves everybody in this, this space. We also have trouble once in a while with them. I know, yeah, yeah, there's some, I'm not, I'm not pointing at anybody in particular here, so don't think we're getting personal. This is, this is the truth. We do have some trouble with the folks that we're sitting around. For some of you who are here with your family, you, you kind of know what I'm talking about here. When we're grumpy, when we're mean, uh, when they're grumpy, when they're mean, when there's bitterness or, or harshness, when hurtful things are said, it's hard to remember that God loves them too. But he does. Even in their sin, even in their brokenness, God loves them. Even in our sin, in our brokenness, God loves us. I want you to, to get this. Uh, uh, behavior does not move the needle on God's love. God does not love us less if we're bad. 
the needle is always pegged. The gauge is always topped out, always, all the time on eternal and everlasting. That's the way God's love works. And so don't worry that somehow we're not getting all the love that we could get because we've been bad or they've been bad. God's love is there. Now, because God put his image in you and loves you and because God loves and put his image in that other person too, what does that mean in terms of relationships? How should we inhabit our relationships? Makes a difference, right? If they're unloved by God, it's easy to hate them, but they're not. What does it do about, how does it affect our relationships outside of this immediate setting with people out there that we genuinely don't like? Okay? See, if God's love for the world really is the whole world, how does that impact our relationships? If God loves everyone and we love God, then what kind of relationship should we have with everyone? I know you're thinking about somebody. Y'all have somebody in mind here, I know. There is that one guy, that one lady. Oh. Yeah, that's who we're talking about. So, love... Love is the motive force. We talked about this last week. We talk about it again. We're going to keep hitting this. Think about this passage that we read, this, this passage from John 15. These are the words of Jesus, by the way, okay? This is not some theologian. This is not Martin Luther. This is not, you know, any modern theologian. It's not Anselm. It's not, it's not Augustine. It's not Paul speaking. This is Jesus the very Son of God who says this stuff. And so we need to really take this seriously, right? If you want to dismiss anything else theologically, you cannot dismiss the words of Christ. No dancing around this, no prevarication, no weak justifications, no rationalizations. It's just do this because Jesus said to do it. And it's pretty clear, right? It's not confusing. It's not wrapped up in fancy words. It's clear, right? Jesus is talking about love. Abide in the love of Jesus. Stay connected to Jesus. Stay in relationship with Jesus. Abide in his love. This is what makes Jesus happy. Actually, it makes him joyous. And that joy is shared with us when we abide. And this is not just for our personal benefit here even though we will richly benefit from this. It's not its only purpose. Because we abide in the love of Jesus, we have what we need to love each other. Because again, think of that person. You don't have it in you to love them. But God does. And if God puts that in you, then you do. This is for others as well. We just have to choose it. And this is where it comes down to God not forcing himself upon us. Jesus is giving us, as we abide in him, all that we need in abundance. All of the motivating love that we could possibly imagine to do exactly what we were designed to do. To be who we are meant to be. It's all there. It's all there. If we choose to abide. If we choose to tap into it. And we, do, we should not lose sight of that if we ever want to be hoped to tran be transformed into the image of Christ. See, love motivates every action that we take, every response, every word, everything should flow from this love. It's at the center of all that we do when we are truly given over to Jesus, when we truly abide in him. The Spirit of God is necessary for this. I don't have this strength in me, but God does. We can't love as we should, and so we need God's presence and God's present love to do this. This is the abiding part, again. But if we do this, we invite the Spirit into our lives, let the Spirit run the show, then love for others becomes a possibility. So imagine our human relationships when we are actually motivated by God's self-giving love. Think about what those would be like. Let's start with the big picture, culturally. I mean, who's turned on the news recently? Oh, 
it's heavy. It's a burden. Culturally, though, I think that if we were motivated by love, we would probably be less likely to vilify and demonize those people that we disagree with. Those monsters over there. Would there be any room for any kind of hateful rhetoric in our public discourse if we were truly motivated by God's love? If God's love were really influencing our interactions, would we treat those who are unlike us with so much disgust and even hatred? I don't think so. So focus it in. What about our neighborhoods? Now we're getting personal here, I know. It's easy to abstract that big stuff, but let's get, let's get down into the neighborhood level here. Does, does the fact that God loves that person, you know, that person, does the fact that God loves that other person, does that have an impact on how we interact with them? With the people that are in our neighborhoods, with the people that we encounter at the stores, on the streets, with those that we work with, with those that we play with, does the fact that God loves them make a difference? Yeah. Well, let's get, let's get really personal here. What about our families? Paul describes love such a wonderful way. 1 Corinthians 13, love passage, you know, you know this one. He says this. Think about this in the context of your families. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable. It keeps no record of wrongs. I remember what you did back in January. Back in that, it keeps no record of wrongs. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Be honest right now. Be serious. You don't have to show it in your face. You don't have to nod your head. You just, in your heart, be honest. Is this a description of our homes? Are we patient and kind with these people that we share life with? Are we able to let the other have their way and not insist on our own way? Or are we irritable? Do we keep a record of wrongs? Are we arrogant or rude or boastful? This is hard stuff. I know I look in the mirror of this text and I don't see myself all the time. Many of our interactions with these people that are closest to us, they do not reflect love, but the opposite. Those most intimate and nurturing relationships that we could possibly have, the ones of our family, our homes, they're sometimes the most hurtful, the most broken. But they don't have to be. They don't have to be. If we allow the Spirit's powerful love to motivate us, to be our motive force, then even those closest to us, the ones that challenge us the most, they can be treated with love. And maybe our home life can start to look a little more like Paul's description I know, I said that it's complex, and it is. I want to recognize that and honor that. So this is not a, very, this is not a simplistic, oh, Pollyannish, love everybody, and it's going to be fine. It's complicated. But we start with love. My nephew, Henry, and his fiancée, Kenzie, they're going to need to figure this out. They are out of their minds right now. I mean, that's what happens when you get married. You are out of your mind. You're not in your right mind when you get married. Thank God for grace, because that's all you can see is that other person. It's like, oh, this is going to be fantastic. But they're going to figure it out. And I think like the rest of my brother's kids, I think that they're well on their way. And this will be, I'm a little bit vain here, this will be three for three for me. I've had a chance to officiate at Catherine's wedding and at Andrew's wedding, and now I get Henry's wedding, and I got, I'm going to do all three of them. So I kind of feel good about that. But each time I do, I think about this stuff relationships, how God has created us for relationship and led us into relationship. You're not connected with the people you are connected to by accident. There is intent. 
There is purpose, both human and divine, that brings us together in these bonds. Whether it's casual, superficial, the relationship that you have with the checker at the grocery store or the waitress at the restaurant, or whether it's intimate and deep, husband and wife, one flesh. All relationships have the hand of God in them. They are all ordained in a certain way by God because this is how God has made us. This is how God has created us, and this is how God wants us to live with each other in relationship. But I'm not telling you anything you don't know when I say that relationships can be challenging. If we approach these things with the wrong attitude, the I-it perspective instead of the I-thou perspective, or in a way that's more in line with our human sinfulness and our selfishness, then... The only thing you're going to get out of that is pain. But if we choose love, that eternal, empowering, everlasting love of God, and only the love of God will do here, then I believe that all relationships can be transformed. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for these people. These people that are here sharing life with each other, I thank you for the way that they've invited me into this space as we have shared life together over the years. It is good to be a part of the people of God, to be in relationship with them. But as we draw, draw close together in this church family and in our, in our human families, we recognize that we are often rough with each other that there is friction, and that we can rub each other raw at times because we try to relate to each other in our humanness. So, Lord, we pray that you would help us transform our relationships with the power of your love. Pour it out in abundance on us. Help us to open our hearts to receive it. Help us to abide in you so that we might love as we are loved. This is a foretaste, a sign of the kingdom to come, and we want to live in it. Pray these things in Christ's precious name. Amen. John said, there's a mistake, but it's only a quarter of a mistake or half a mistake because it's right up there and it's right page and right song, just the wrong hymnal. So if you're in a blue, a red one, switch to a blue one, same page, 226. If you got everything right, please stand. <laughs> Just as free.
Again, reminder about the meeting. Come on down, have a snack, sit around, learn about how we do things. You are invited to do that. Um, let's pray together. Lord, we do pray that you would bring forth your kingdom. We know that it is yours to announce and yours to bring about, and we are your willing servants in it. We are that pilgrim people that is moving forward in love, doing the work that you place in our hands. We will depart from this place to do that to share your love with those that need it. And so we pray for your, your strength and your empowerment to do it and the abundance of your love that we are meant to share. Lord, we ask a blessing on the meeting that we will share in to the information that we, will, that we will chat about. And we just ask that you would bless that time together as well. In all things, Lord, we give you the praise and the honor and the glory because you are worthy of it. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. You may go in peace.